Hi, everybody. Thanks for joining this session. Uh, I'm Ilan Unle. Um, I work at BlockLab, and I will tell you in a minute what BlockLab all does. I am a blockchain engineer at BlockLab. Um, I get to think about decentralized systems, architect them, well, design, architect them, and eventually build them. Um, today's presentation will be about onboarding Web3 developers. So since we have a time span of 30 to 45 minutes, um, I, I save the presentation like not to go too much into depth. Like I would want this like to be somewhat of a discovery uh, for a lot of people. Um, I also don't know how, um, how acquainted you are with Web3 technologies, but um, maybe, um, yeah, it's, it's like if you have any questions, just shoot. Um, so this, this presentation will be mainly about Web3 technologies, in particular about blockchains. Um, also, how does it work? Why blockchains? Why would you develop one? Uh, why would you develop an application on a blockchain? And from there on, uh, we're just going to go out to have a look under the hood in different blockchains, what they have to offer, and how we can develop on them. So that's all in 30 to 45 minutes. I made it as compact as possible uh, while giving, uh, while for, so you guys can get the most out of it. And if you have any more questions afterwards, then you can always uh, chat with me, email me. So I leave that up to you guys. So let's kick off. So I work for BlockLab, as I said, and BlockLab is a subsidiary of the Port of Rotterdam. And BlockLab was uh, started because, well, there was this new technology coming around the corner called blockchain, and it was supposed to like uh, make the world a different place. And so the Port of Rotterdam and the municipality of Rotterdam, uh, after a research paper on this technology, they decided to uh, fund a small subsidiary to basically do development in uh, mainly two uh, sectors. One is energy and the other one is supply chain and logistics. So we are uh, heavily focusing on these two sectors and we're applying all sorts of uh, small proof of concepts, uh, a bit bigger uh, minimum viable products until our own products that we want to roll out and eventually make a own startup. And we're also like a organization that um, is there in order like to spread the word. So we love to collaborate with startups. Uh, we have a uh, good collaboration with the University of uh, TU Delft. Uh, next to that, uh, the Bachelor uh, University Hochschool Rotterdam uh, with bigger enterprises and also with governmental institutions. So in essence, like we, we we're basically like a small lab that does like experimentation in these two sectors and um, having the Port of Rotterdam, which is a huge organization and authority in the municipality and in the province, um, but that also helps with basically like uh, reaching out to bigger organizations. So now you have an idea what Block Lab is. And now let's skip over to why was blockchain found so relevant? So blockchain is a technology, it started off with Bitcoin. Um, and what Bitcoin showed us was that you can exchange uh, value without having to trust the parties that you're doing business with. So you can trust the protocol that it will uh, send your money from A to B and will not like make it magically disappear. These are basically the principles of the, the cryptography, the underlying cryptography and the logic of the blockchain itself. Um, and also like what, what also makes blockchain like um, very relevant is that you cannot change what happened. In, in theory you can, but it is, so like the blocks get basically, they get formed on top of each other. So each new block will point to the previous block so if you want to change what happened like to the block like before, then you would have to go very deep and eventually you would have to pay a lot of money to basically revert that. So it's like theoretically possible, but in reality, it's almost impossible. 
Like we're talking about magnitudes of uh, countries that could be um, um, like that could be doing this. But then again, why would a country um, attack a cryptocurrency? Well, they could, but let's not get into that. Um, and also what is nice about the blockchain is that everything is fully transparent and auditable. So you always get to see what is happening. So you can always backtrace what happens. Um, these are the three main features why you would develop on a blockchain. So the, the, like not having to trust one another, basically like you want an immutable history and you want everything to be transparent and auditable. Um, and the fourth point you see there, the robustness, that comes from the, the three main technologies that create a blockchain. We'll, we'll get into that. So as I said, the three main technologies are um, cryptography uh, that comes from the generation of public private keys. So to basically hack that, you would either need quantum computers or uh, a billion years. Um, the hash functions that get created on um, uh, by doing a transaction that can always, um, you can always like prove that you were the one creating something. So you always have a, a key that you can prove something with. Uh, the peer-to-peer -peer networks, that's what make it robust. So I can run a node from my home and 10,000 other people could do this as well. So that's what makes it um, almost impossible to shut it down. Um, also, like looking at the previous, uh, maybe in the two slides ago, like I showed a tweet that basically like it's an unstoppable technology. Um, and this is for a lot of organizations and institutions a possible threat. But it's also something beautiful for the people that want to do good with it. Uh, and the underlying game theory is that a blockchain should give you the economic incentive to keep it in the air. So, these things like we should not just run a blockchain because we don't trust our government or something. No, we should do like we should run a blockchain because like it might give you something. It you might hold some value on it, or you might want to earn on it, or you have an application or organization on it. So these are like um, it should give you something back. So the, the incentive to keep it alive is very much into the protocol, um, which I will show you. Give you an example on Bitcoin about. Uh, and furthermore, the consensus, of course, that everybody on the same chain uh, where the protocol and the nodes are constantly uh, agreeing on the latest state of the ledger. And that is simply like just software doing um, its work. This is an overview from the Bitcoin blockchain. Uh, and it's, it's, it seems a bit chaotic, but I'll... I'll, I'll guide you through it. So on the left, as I said, like these blocks constantly pointing to the last one. So one points to zero, two points to one. And that is basically the chain of blocks. Um, it points with a hash of the previous one. So it, they're basically like knitted together. And well, if you would want to change one, you would have to change all the ones before. Um, so what happens, a user on the top um, has a wallet, has a private key wants to send money to some family or wants to buy something. And when that transaction is done, it comes through a node and it ends up in the network. Everybody sees that transaction in a transaction pool. And some lucky miner, well, usually most of them are in China. So some lucky miner finds this block, uh, finds this transaction and other transactions and puts it in a block. And once that block is um, um, sent into the network, then everybody should agree that this is the next best block. So it gets added to the ledger. And this is in essence what, what it does. This is what Bitcoin does. Um, it's a value transfer chain and it's simple as that. And it's been going live already for 11 to 12 years. Um, and yeah, as I said, robust, unstoppable, um, and it works, it always works. No downtime. So that, that, that was a small overview of what blockchain was. And now I want to go into, so what is, what is it that BlockLab does with this technology? So as I said, you, you need to have it applied on a place where people don't trust each other. Um, 
and for instance, the energy landscape, not saying that they don't trust each other, but you have a lot of um, stakeholders or that that have it, that are itself decentralized. So you see a lot of more solar panels nowadays. You have energy storage, which can be batteries. You have heat pumps, you have wind parks, you have electric cars. All these uh, components are on their own machines, machines that need to, that can communicate to a, um, a central market, a decentralized market, what is, yeah, what, what is happening? Like how much solar panel are you generating? How much storage do you have left? You want to have these um, basically communicating with each other so you can um, optimize them. So currently, like the current market structure as it is, you have the, the meter operator and you have a network operator all trying to balance the grid. Uh, these, this is very like critical work. Um, and I'm happy that they're doing that because uh, the, the, the power outages in the Netherlands are like barely, you don't have any. Um, so they're doing a great job and I wouldn't want to change that. But in a decentralized market, you can, um, what, what is the plan is to basically optimize it cost-wise. Um, so if, if I am uh, generating solar, I would want to be in direct contact with a potential buyer instead of like delivering it back to the grid and getting, because maybe if that market would be possible, um, then I could maybe get a higher price or um, I could get it myself. Um, and also there is, there is also like this part of like the actual electricity payments and data. These are the three streams. And also like it, it, the blockchain could also add a lot on the payments and to the data side. Um, so, um, and I will give you an example of what we did with this. So we have a product called Distro, and this is one of the products um, that is my main focus um, the last year. Uh, so we have built a, um, a platform that is a marketplace uh, at, its, at its core. And in this marketplace, uh, we have specific services running on top of that. So we have um, solar panels, we have batteries, uh, wind turbines, and um, all of these have their own smart meters. And every five minutes, we collect this data. It collected, we don't store it on chain. Um, only if someone wants to uh, basically uh, reconcile, meaning that a person wants to um, uh, like get get basically do a micro transaction on what they what they bought or what they sold, uh, then this is possible, uh, and it it happens automatically every every fifty minutes. So that is basically our window of trade. We have price oracles coming in, uh, meaning what is the price outside of our blockchain. So we have an internal market, but we also have to look outside of our internal market to see what's happening out. So we can set some baselines on what is the what are the boundaries of our market. Furthermore, what does this market do? Uh, we have an AI, AI powered uh, virtual agents buying and selling energy. So all this data uh, gets aggregated into a database. And from there on, the AI learns, okay, he's trying to figure out patterns, like what time do you do your wash or what time do you actually go to sleep? Um, and tries to graph out like for the coming, for a forecasting of two days, what your energy uh, profile looks like and buys already uh, days ahead what you, what you possibly might need. Um, and this has been a pilot and it's been successful. Uh, we tested it in the innovation dock in Rotterdam. That is um, a old, uh, uh, like an old uh, place where they, I think were constructing, how do you call that? Um, on their Zeeboot, it's like U-boats or um, sub submarines. Um, and now it's like this place where you have a lot of little companies that are like working on innovative technologies. Um, and, and this is nice, like this is possible. And this is a simple microgrid. So all these people are connected with each other and can uh, share their energy with each other. And we've seen that it basically like it optimizes. So people pay less because 
um, well, also the rooftop is filled with solar panels, so it's, it's a bit of cheating. But essentially, you could do this also in a um, like in a neighborhood with households that have uh, solar panels enough. So what's another project that BlockWeb did? Um, so we created. So this is a different project again. Uh, we created this um, idea of shared assets. So we all have assets. We have cars. We have solar panels. Uh, pro potentially like batteries or maybe other stuff that you want to share or you but if if we want to share something like there is no registration of like where where do who keeps the count of like whose share it is and how do we decide over this uh, and what about the earnings of these shares so for instance there was this idea we we wrote it out and a group of uh, computer science students at the TU Delft uh, built this demo for us called the shared assets or they called it asset share um, and it it created this um, so they forked it from Aragon and Aragon is a, a decentralized autonomous organization framework that gives you all most of the tooling that you need to kickstart uh, your virtual company or your virtual organization and uh, they adjusted the, the logic within Aragon where you could basically do this shared assets element in there. Uh, and for someone that is interested in this line of work, um, I added a link to the GitHub repo. I will share this um, later on with you guys, uh, this presentation, so you can go and visit and look at it. But this shows basically the power of uh, blockchain, uh, the 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 bottom up organization uh the more like the social coordination of buying an asset uh sharing what comes out of this asset so if i have a solar panel the earnings i send it back to the grid so i could have 10 to a thousand shareholders it wouldn't change my cost how i um how i distribute this because it happens on the blockchain and this is the last project I'll be talking about. So I'm mainly talking about the energy side because that's what I've been focusing on for the last two years. Uh, Uhu is uh, Open Energy Hub, and this was all before the the previous two projects. So this was very much on the smart meter side. So we started collecting all this data, and we said like, hey, maybe people want to be in charge of their data. Um, eventually turned out people don't really want that, but maybe that's also just as good as the interface you give people. Um, however, it was a small experiment that we did and we wrote this software that you could um, uh, deploy it on your Raspberry Pi. You simply connect it to your meter and it gives, it throughputs all these things that go onto the blockchain and we try to anonymize the data. And from there on, people could basically claim their smart meter. And from here on, they could create some sort of an identity. And with this identity, they could go eventually and sell that data in an aggregated way or all together. So we were a bit early with all this. Um, so this this part, Ocean Protocol currently is live and it's, you can basically like place data there and people can stake their tokens. Meaning if you stake your token that you're basically behind that this data is valuable. And it's basically like a, um, like a community effort where you show like the more stake tokens is the more relevant this data might be. Um, well, we, we did this all two years ago and now we're at a very different place, but it's also like a great repo to look into, like if you're interested into this, in, into ocean or into smart meters, um, you can do a lot of nice stuff. And this is the last project that I'll be talking about trying to skip the slide I think I move too much hmm. yeah we were here so as I said the title of the presentation is um, that tree. I don't know why you're seeing that. Um, so what is Web tree? It, it definitely uh, incorporates blockchain, um, but Web tree is a broad movement and a group of associated technologies and people 
aiming to make the web and the internet more decentralized, verifiable, and secure. Um, so, as I said, trustless, that is one of the things that blockchain hashing cryptography can add. Removing intermediaries, so there should be no one in between the line where we, as people, are transacting. So currently with WhatsApp, with even this part of technology, we're doing it all on, um, thanks to Google, on their great servers. Doesn't mean that they are not eavesdropping, um, which we all know, but we somehow accepted it. But some people are very fierce in this, and it's their personal goal to basically bring these technologies to humanity. And for whatever reason, like, um, doesn't matter. And also giving people the power and the ownership over their data, identity, uh, and transactions. So that's a, those are, um, well, these are the three main pillars of um, what people in Web3 movements are trying to do. So let's look at what is Web3 exactly. So we had uh, Web 1.0, which was read-only and was decentralized. So decentralized in the sense that everybody had their own servers. Uh, now we have Web 2.0, uh, which is, yeah, it is very centralized, and but we can participate in it. We can be our own person. Um, and then there is Web3, so where there are no intermediaries and is decentralized. And I will focus on these technologies in the coming slides. And there is also this notion that Web3 can't be evil. Um, well, this is, this is not true, uh, because in Web3, you're you're interacting with people and people can be malicious. So if I deploy a contract that where I'm saying like when I'm selling something or I have tokens or I'm providing a service, like I could also make sure that I design that contract in such a way that it it's it's that I profit from it. And it is it is a bit of like a a jump between web two web two and web three. It it is a bit of a like a so you you need some skill of reading code. You need some skill of hacking. And it's usually not very fair for a lot of people that cannot. So auditors and people that can translate these things, even like translating them into laws eventually, like this is a very um, required skill and a needed skill for the coming world. Um, but yeah, it, it doesn't mean that as we go to Web3 that it becomes less evil. No, it's like then it, it's, it's, it just takes a different form. So uh, the tech stack of Web3 looks as following. Um, so we here have on layer zero, we have the usual peer-to-peer. -peer, um, and next to that, we have the, the, the description language. So on Ethereum, it's EVM. On Polkadot, it's Wasm. On Bitcoin, it's UTXO. Um, these are basically like just the, 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 what is inherent to the protocol. Uh, and it, as we go up uh, one layer, uh, then you have very specific data-related layers. So that is the data distribution protocols. You have specific platforms that offer shared security. I will all go into this. Uh, you have just messaging stuff. So for instance, Matrix and Whisper, they offer already on layer one, uh, exchanging messages end-to-end uh, -end encrypted without anybody getting through that. Um, and these are, yeah, these are all adding to this tech stack. Uh, layer two, I will also go a bit into that. That is basically like just working, um, um, that like these can be very different from each other. So you see a lot of terms, maybe they're familiar, maybe not. Um, but it's, it's basically like for, for the layer one to function well or to specialize on them. So there is this thing called state channels um, where you're basically um, creating a channel between two people that can interact um, like a, a specified amount or an unspecified amount, but in a very quick fashion. And eventually like a blockchain cannot offer that. So blockchain, doesn't offer you currently like a high throughput machine. It offers you security, it offers you um, a robustness uh, and all these things, but like all the, all the speed, for instance, like what is used in financial systems currently, like that is not what a blockchain is. And sometimes that's hard to grasp for people. Um, and layer three and four, well, layer four is the interface and layer three is the components 
um, to translate like all this to APIs and to the actual used languages. So another comparison between Web2 and Web3. Um, as you can see it like a standard Web2 application would have a web server that eventually like uh, you have an application on some web elements and through the internet you can see it on the front end. So it still has that. Uh, it's just everything like in the Web3 part of it, possibly this web server could be the decentralized web. So that you don't see in this application. And what and the data that actually like this application needs, it could get that from the blockchain, which you are sure of that you trust it, where you have your money on or your identity or whatever. Um, and also what what like you you also play a role in basically seeing what happens on the blockchain, whereas this would be a closed source or the, the author of a website would have to um, make it open source. But none of the big social media platforms is open source, for instance, or any other website or your banking. Um, and and that that for a lot of people like, um, yeah, they, they basically like need or they want to have this auditability where we relied on these bigger institutions to basically have a reputation and do the job for us. Whereas here you could have a very different system where um, things could come quicker to light because you would have like some sort of like tech reporters. Um, not 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 going too deep in there, but just just saying like the difference between Web two and Web three is that people have more control um, because you could you you own your wallet and no one else, and also. Uh, if you lose your wallet, yeah, that's 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 not good because there is not a way to recover that, unless you have specific measures in place, and those tooling also gets better every day. So let's look into Ethereum. Um, this is one of the biggest platforms that is out there that offers smart contract functionality. It brought a lot of innovation uh, into the blockchain world. So they gave, um, for instance, like specific standards were found here. ERC-20, which is the standard token for any token that is not an Ethereum token. So you can create a token today. Um, I don't know what its value would be, but you could do it. Uh, you can create, they found the standard of ERC-721s, which are non-fungibles. That could mean like a, a specific item that is unique. So think of a collection card, Yeah, I got muted. Um, and what else was found by uh, Ethereum? So uh, this whole notion of stable tokens. So um, blockchains are um, like the prices of like these tokens, they go up and down daily. So they found this um, stable token where you basically put in a collateral and you get back a stable token that could be equal to $1 or 1 euro. Um, and there's a lot of like um, um, stuff happening on layer two, which means how are we going to scale Ethereum? So currently, like if you, if the Ethereum blockchain is currently very popular, um, just seeing, let's see, I, um, waves to the NSA. So what's a smart contract? I'll get into the smart contract. Um, yeah, so they, they, Ethereum basically has found like a lot of innovation. Um, you can go deeper into this, you can ask questions later. Um, but it's run basically by this Ethereum virtual machine, um, where, which is basically the compiler of a smart contract. And once you publish a smart contract, it gets a specific hash, which is the address of the contract. And you could, uh, it's on it forever. That's the idea. Um, there is this other, uh, yeah, you're right. What is a smart contract? So a smart contract is um, is is an application as you, I, I will give an example at the end of the presentation, what a smart contract is and how you develop one, um, if we have time for it. So it's, 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 it's basically logic that you place on a blockchain. So if I can say 
um, who gets to be the presenter, uh, the host of this uh, session. And if we all agree to abide to these rules, whatever comes into the smart contract, then we could program that. So it's nothing else than an application, but it's immutable. It's there for good. It, it, is, immut it is mutable if you program it that way. I hope that was good enough. I will give you an example later on. Um, another framework that I want to focus on, just looking at the time here, is the Substrate framework. Uh, and this framework is the latest, the, the cutting edge technology. So the founder of this uh, framework was also a co-founder of Ethereum. He decided that Ethereum wasn't going quick enough. Um, so he decided like uh, three years ago to start uh, Polkadot, which eventually led to a Substrate framework. And what this thing does is basically a framework where you can start your own uh, application specific blockchain. So Ethereum is one big blockchain and you have smart contracts you can push on it. And with Substrate, you get a application specific blockchain. So you everything comes out of the box. So you won't have to think about your peer to peer networking. You can just pick a consensus system. Uh, only thing that you need to work on is the runtime. So the, the, the logic of your blockchain, like what is the purpose? Um, I've added a link here as well. Try it out. Um, it's on substrate.dev. It's it's written in Rust. It's very like it has a very steep learning curve. I'm learning it still, um, and but like it's it's yeah, it's a very good framework. So after you've created your blockchain, like what? How how does it like work? Um, so this is a maybe a bit of a hard diagram, but eventually like what you see here on this thing called a relay chain. These are presented by Polkadot and Kusama. And these are basically the chains that interconnect other blockchains with each other. Because blockchains have this problem of working truly in isolation. So everything that's true happens on the blockchain itself. And if you want data from the outside, you would have to get that. So you would have to build oracles or bridges. And this thing, the relay chain has basically a messaging bus through all these different parachains. And you could like, uh, a blockchain develop an application specific develop with substrate could be eventually a parachain or a parathread on Polkadot. So not going too much in here, but this is um, this is like a the the latest uh, generation of blockchains that gives you also on chain governance. So you can vote basically with your uh, with the value you have. Um, like with, with the tokens you have about a specific outcome. Um, as I said, scaling and privacy uh, on, on Ethereum, it has opened this, uh, this door for um, cryptographers and developers uh, that wasn't there before. So I think like blockchains uh, opened that after Bitcoin. And um, it, is, it is like a very highly developed um, uh, like very active community of cryptographers that um, are trying to like make sure blockchains can have privacy in its protocol. So that means nobody can see what's happening. This already happens with Zcash, for instance. It's an anonymous cryptocurrency. So if I would send uh, Zcash from my private address to another private address, there is no way of tracking that. Um, and the same the same technology. Uh, can also be developed on Ethereum. So that's what Aztec does. And also the same technology is used for scaling Ethereum. So with cryptography, with uh, ZK rollups, for instance, you can do a lot of transactions. So we're talking about the thousand, two thousands likes of transactions per second. And these can end up eventually by um, cryptography, by uh, zero knowledge proofs. These can end up being one transaction in the main chain. So that's layer uh, one. So layer two, you do infinite amount of transactions, you pack them up, you say this is the hash pointing to the previous block and you 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 place a transaction on the main chain. So this is the layer two parts. This is like how, um, how Ethereum envisions a uh, part where uh, more people can use a blockchain or a specific application without having these congestions. Another tech tree stack that maybe you've heard about this, uh, IPFS, the interplanetary file system. Um, yeah, what, what's, what's to say about it? Uh, it's, it's, it's a decentralized storage place. Um, it's open source. 
uh, works very stable, uh, works always out of the box. And um, a lot of people use it, for instance, like if they want to uh, publicly place something that, or you don't want it to be, uh, you don't want to place it on a central place where someone could just delete it. Um, IPFS is a great place and I would definitely um, advise you to look into this. And I think we're close towards the end. Um, I also discussed first in the shared assets example that that decentralized or autonomous organizations are are like uh, is is a tool for uh, communities, ideas, um, goals, um, and what they offer is basically uh, a bottom-up way of organizing yourself. So um, even though all these things are based on like nothing is holding you to the blockchain, right? It's not some sort of law yet, uh, but it only becomes real if you add value to it. So if I place, I don't know, like a thousand euros in something and I say like, yeah, come on, um, I want to participate. Then eventually like I've shown that I value this by adding some sort of money or my time or ideas. And um, like these are very powerful tools happening in this way because uh, the idea, the value that you get out of it, um, they're all in one place. and there are no intermediaries anymore. Um, so it can be, it, it just happens all on very, very on chain. So you have a lot of these DAOs um, on chain doing specific things again on chain. It doesn't really exert itself to the outside world yet, um, but I think that will come. So now let's go over to the demo. What is a smart contract? There is this tool called uh, Remix, and it's eventually a uh, an, uh, an editor uh, in your browser. Um, and what it does is it, it has a lot of features. So this started off very basic, and it's now very heavy in your browser. Uh, it gives you some example um, smart contracts. It gives you some tests, and it gives you Swarm and IPFS connections, but we won't go into that. So let's look at the standard smart contracts. Um, yeah, and as I said, Ethereum runs on an EVM, so it, it has this EVM environment in the browser. So you have a JavaScript virtual machine that gives you also all these accounts, and they all have 100 test Ether on them. So let's look at storage. So what does storage do? At every smart contract, you would have to basically, you would have to uh, define what version of Solidity would, would compile this. Uh, and then the contract name is storage. And you define the UN256, which is a number. And the function of this contract is to basically store this number and make it publicly available. That's all this contract does. Very simple. Um, and you basically go to the second tab where you say, let's compile storage. And after you press compile, you can look into the metadata for the opts and you would see all this. Uh, eventually what the contract assembly does is, well, it looks like this, but that's not very relevant. Um, and let's say we want to deploy this contract. You see this account has a hundred ether. So the whole thing works on Ethereum works on Ether, and Ether is the, the native token of Ethereum, and you need it to interact with, well, not to interact, to deploy or do a transaction on Ethereum. So if you don't have the balance, you cannot do a transaction. So I can say um, deploy, and it would give me this green check mark saying that the deploy was successful. And I could see my contract here. So under deployed contracts, I have now the storage contract, which is, as I said, um, at this address where you could not interact with it, but because this is happening locally on my browser, but that is how an address looks like. Um, so I could just store a number from the same account. I could store the number five. Um, and I could get back what is the number? Retrieve it, and I get back the number five. 
And if I would change accounts or if this would happen actually on a main chain or a test net, everybody would see that number five. So you have one source of truth at all times and that's what a blockchain should be. Um, what is another example? Um, so I won't go into the owner contract. Um, I would just like pinpoint some stuff that I think is relevant to your development and to blockchains in general. Um, the other one is Open Zeppelin contracts. These, um, this organization, Open Zeppelin, they've been around since like the conception of Ethereum, and they have been very good at auditing and creating standardized contracts. So they have like the ERC20 token, the ERC721 tokens, like maybe you've heard about like recent blockchain uh, hacks or that money is being drained. Like, these people make sure that the contracts that are in this repo, they don't do that as long as you don't build too much functionality on top of it. Um, so these are the standards of e uh, ERC tokens you can create. So this is, as I said, uh, fungible. This is non-fungible. Uh, this has, this is the ERC 777 is in addition to ERC 20. Um, yeah, you, there's a lot of cool contracts that you can learn some smart contracts with in this repository. Um, advise you to check that out. Uh, the other uh, link that I want to uh, show you guys is Substrate Recipes. Um, well, actually not even the recipes I want to show you. I want to show you this, the tutorials. So as I said, written in Rust, but it offers um, very application specific stuff, uh, cutting edge, you can create like, uh, there are a lot of like palettes you can basically drag into your blockchain if you need them, for instance, on chain government or a governance or um, uh, what kind of consensus system, you can all um, create a basic understanding by following these tutorials or um, reading through the knowledge base. Um, definitely advise you guys to do this. And, and that's it. At the end of this presentation, I have a couple of links that I uh, gathered for you guys. So there's this massive open online course uh, the, provided by Web3 Foundation, which are the founders of Polkadot. Uh, some other uh, courses and tutorials on writing smart contracts. The Crypto Zombies one is very good. Um, it's also a bit interactive and playful. Um, yeah, and that's it. That was my presentation. Let me just turn let me just turn on the lights. Do you guys have any questions? No. Do you guys want me to give you some more examples or you think it's good enough? Maybe you guys are just not very interested in blockchains. Yeah, so I think Kim's question was answered in a way. Um, so I've, I've, I, you see, you see my screen. Um, so a smart contract is basically the logic you put into it. So it could be a storage contract. You could just do a number. Um, this one is a bit more, for instance, like this is a ballot. So a ballot, uh, it has a struct called voter. It gives a specific weight to a voter. 
it, it keeps a Boolean whether that voter voted yes or no, true or false. Uh, the address of the delegate, so a voter could delegate his vote. Uh, so this is about uh, voting and ballots. Um, and then there's a specific chairperson. So it says here, the person that deploys this contract, the message sender of this contract is the chairperson. So that would be me. And I could, after that, give people um, the right to vote. So I could, I could give you the right to vote if you have an address for me. Um, and, and then it's, it, so the smart contract is, is, is basically like the, the smart contract language written in Solidity translates itself into opcodes through the Ethereum virtual machine and becomes a hash on the blockchain that is, um, is for instance, like you can reach it out. So I think one of the, the most, um, I think you have some contracts here. So let's see. For instance, oh, uh, which smart contract shall we look into? Um, ah, for instance, Dai. Dai is a stable token, um, and you basically see here what's happening with Dai. You can see a total supply of Dai, so there's nine hundred ninety-six million dollars minted, and Dai is a stable token, so you have to put in some collateral for it to come out. Eventually, you could see on the blockchain what are the exchanges. So most of what happens on the blockchain is trade. So people are trying to make a fortune out of this, but also with the possibility of, um, for instance, stable tokens being out there, there's also like a lot of like business logic in there. So you have people like doing um, uh, um, insurance on blockchains and usually again on trades. Um, for, for all this logic to come to another place, um, so there is, for instance, this place called um, Realty, tokenized real estate. They are in the U.S. and what they do is they, they buy lots of land um, or just a lot and they say, hey, this thing has an asset price and we just set a token price. So you buy, you buy a house, right? You, buy, you say buy now. Eventually, I think you would have to identify yourself. So you, you have the same shopping cart, right? You say, hey, I want 10 tokens. And then eventually what they do is after you have probably like identified yourself and you want to proceed to checkout, you would have to pay this amount of money in a stable token or they will translate it to Ethereum with a specific commission on it. I don't know how it really goes, but then eventually that translates itself to a token, a token that you can show on a main chain that you're the rightful owner of that real estate property. Um, and that, that is it. That is what the blockchain does. It offers us a, um, a single source of truth that the world really needs. Let me see 916. So I'm understanding correct that blockchains are not necessarily currency related, but can also just store data. Yes, that's true. They wouldn't have to be uh, currency related. So for instance, the example I gave you with, um, with uh, Uhu, the open energy hub, it's just data. So we were just storing values of smart meters, eventually um, extracting that and selling that data on chain. We needed the blockchain for people to trust it. Well, we actually didn't even really need a blockchain. So I think the blockchain part is just relevant when you're really um, creating, that you're operating in, uh, in an environment where people simply don't trust each other or don't know each other. And it, it can become this coordination um, tool. Sorry, I missed that. Also, are there other applications for blockchain that are currency related that are, uh, maybe I missed the intention, but I wasn't sure about that. That aren't currency related. Yeah, there are, well, like, you know, the thing with the token is the markets will, will value anything. So, so I, I told you, for instance, about the ocean protocol. And what it is, is for instance, like the token itself, like the markets, because they're free, they can just flow from in the Ethereum chain anywhere someone will give money for it eventually and, and they become automatically cryptocurrencies. 
it's not a payment method. So, so for instance, this the, the ocean token is done, for instance, on for instance, there's there's this data set analysis of mental health support. Let's see what else they got. Or slash consumer browsing data. So someone has been gathering consumer browsing data. And what does it do? Number of data points, uh, a thousand K data union, new partnerships, et cetera, et cetera. And what, what does this do? Like it has, it generated or it gathered almost 30,000 ocean tokens that has a value of around 13,000 euros. Um, it's not that the ocean token was created for it eventually to be, you know, transacted. So that I would pay in ocean tokens after I buy a beer. No, it's just they they get valued that way. Um, but every every specific application needs a token because there is this thing called token economics. So where you build in incentives in a token for people to use it. Um, in 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 Ocean's case, it's staking on data. It's basically saying, hey, this data set people value. It's required. And if there's a good data set, I would probably also like stake my ocean tokens, but definitely not on this. And yeah, so people just, um, so it, it gathers value automatically. But for instance, like Bitcoin was known as the peer-to-peer -peer cash or peer-to-peer -peer value exchange. That is very much a cryptocurrency, uh, also like for payments. And there are other tokens that can just do more. So for instance, you also have proof of stake There's also like proof of stake where your tokens are basically securing the network. Uh, so you need tokens to to basically secure the network so that someone else doesn't. Um, so you and if you bond your tokens to the network, you get back what is called inflation uh, on your earnings. On so you get more of the native tokens and you can eventually sell those or you can buy something with them. But uh, it's just that the market values these things. They're not like necessarily designed for them to have value. But then again, I think it's good, like it's a good ecosystem because so the teams that generate these tokens, they 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 get money, of course, but also their token is valued something. So they would have to work to to increase the value of their own token. And that is what you expect of a cryptocurrency team or a blockchain team. Okay. Yeah. This uh, the question from Eileen. Um, thanks for your question. I really recommend you to start off with uh, the the Crypto Zombies course. It's it's really neat and it's all very interactive. Um, it's it, it's you it's it gets you really through true solidity so there are a couple of paths here you can take uh, uh, basic solidity advanced solidity so you get here a bit more and then beyond ethereum you have intro into zk sync so this is layer two and advanced zk sync so libra was i think the failed cryptocurrency of facebook and binance chain well if you like it can do it um but this is this is a good starter for a lot of people. So a lot of people that start in our company that we basically point them to create a game. So that's the best way to learn. Yeah, guys, thank you too. Was a was a good session, I believe. You're welcome. Yeah. I'm happy you guys enjoyed it. That uh, was my biggest fear. So how does this go? Do I just drop out or? Yeah. Thank you too, Mick, for the opportunity.
Yeah. Have a good evening, everyone. And if you have any questions, um, you can reach out on Elon at Block Lab. Now. So um, take care and uh, good luck with the course.